call our first 2019 um, work session to order. Thank you for being here and happy new year. Um, before we start this meeting, I would like to take the time to welcome, welcome our newest member of the Board of Commissioners, um, which is District 3 Commissioner uh, Terenia Carthen. Uh, we'd like to welcome you. Just tell you a little bit about our great commissioner. Commissioner Carthen brings a wealth of knowledge and business acumen expertise that will further enhance effective and efficient budgetary oversight as this Board of Commissioners continues to continue our mission of working in a unified and bipartisan manner to leverage tax dollars, uh, the taxpayers' dollars here in Douglas County. I am particularly excited about Commissioner Carthen's strong technology background and look forward to her and Commissioner Mitchell advancing and modernizing our Celebrate <coughs> Douglas County website to allow our citizens to gain easy access to any and all applications of interest. Most importantly, Commissioner Carthen is committed to working on behalf of the concerns of all Douglas County citizens. And please help me welcome our energetic and committed Commissioner of District 3, Dorinia Carthen. Now we'll move to the order of business. First, public comment. We have two individuals who signed and um, signed up today, and Mr. Larry <coughs> Pierce and <coughs> Professor Tomaski. I will ask you to come forth, uh, Mr. Pierce, in just a second. I just wanted to make it sh uh, clear to you that the Board of Commissioners welcome our citizens' comment, and it is uh, our, my goal to make uh, sure that these meetings run smoothly and uh, efficiently and effectively. And I ask that uh, you follow the rules of that three-minute rule, please, um, as our citizens watch on TV. And we want to be very uh, sensitive to the time of the Board of Commissioners and also to our directors <coughs> and staff here today. Um, we respect your comments. Uh, and I ask uh, that uh, you address your government, uh, that you ask questions and address the needs of government, if you have some. Uh, but we will ask questions, not you today. However, um, please start, and uh, you have a three-minute rule, and just be wonderful. Okay? You may begin. Thank you. Larry Pierce, 4120 Advanced Ant Road, Douglasville, Georgia. I've been a citizen since 1968. I'd like to especially say, Glad for joining the party. <coughs> it's fun. Um, <coughs> it's nice to be first in something, and I, re I really appreciate the fact that I'm the first one to address you this year. And as such, I, uh, I even cleaned up for you. You notice my Santa beer is gone, my hair is gone, but some other things weight-wise, it's not gone. <coughs> now, I wanted to tell you, as if I didn't have enough to do, I have decided to uh, kind of join forces with the city council <coughs> of my own volition. And that is to uh, try to see if the train depot that's 10 miles out of town may someday come back to Douglasville. <coughs> now where? Well, I've also involved myself in the cleanup, maybe, question mark, explanation, <coughs> of the mill. It's been an eyesore. And I never have understood how government sometimes don't seem to get along. The city is over here, but it's in Douglas County, and the umbrella is everywhere, okay? So the reason I say that is because sooner or later, we have to work together in regards to certain things for the betterment of everybody. So, don't know exactly which way this is going, except these two reports here from Jacobs Engineering don't have anything to do with the county. But this right here costs fifty thousand dollars for the city. Okay, fifty thousand. It's not all of it. It's five hundred and twenty-six pages of which I bought for ten cents a page. And they're proposing that it's going to cost $714,000 to clean it up. 
So you know me, I'm looking into it, and I definitely will be the devil's advocate on that. <coughs> so uh, the train cars <coughs> are gone. They're in Alabama somewhere being held hostage by the man who repaired the train for the city when the flood came. And I think I know where they're at. They're somewhere in Alabama by a man who loves trains. And the reason I'm going to try to befriend him is he's got the trucks <coughs> that go under the cars. And I heard there was a little squabble in the contract, and he said, nah, 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 if you don't want to pay me the rest, I'll keep the trucks and, and up. So I'm trying to do that. But it, it, it's a fun thing, and eventually there'll probably be some cooperation from the county to do certain things. I don't know how it's going to be moved here. It costs $10,000 to move it there. And it's still good. It's still there. <coughs> and it's the real depot. And it might can be enhanced and be put somewhere that everybody can enjoy it <coughs> someday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pierce. We will take your this matter under advisement. Next, we have Professor Professor Damaski. Please come forward. Please give me the address uh, for the record. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Uh, John Damaski, 6000 Stewart Parkway. I'm speaking on the subject <coughs> of uh, maternal health. Uh, which is extremely <coughs> critical subject. Uh, the uh, World, World Health Organization published a study where over the uh, last decade in several countries, both uh, first, cla first class developed countries and the next rung, every country improved in regard to post-maternal health and infant mortality over that decade, except the United States. Even Mexico, Indonesia, they all improved. The United States got worse also recently reported, in the United States, the state with the least enviable record is Georgia. There was also published several months ago <coughs> in a national newspaper an extensive study on post-maternal death where it was found that <coughs> hemorrhaging and blood pressure complications would have been avoided had hospitals gone by recommended practices. You have conscious disregard and neglect of well-known and published best practices for post-maternal health, and women are dying. The statistics in that study indicated that 90% of post-maternal deaths through hemorrhaging would have been prevented had practices been followed, as they should be. 60% the post-maternal blood pressure <coughs> complications. On WSB TV News a few days ago, they interviewed the husband of a woman in a local hospital who died after delivery. He saw his wife after the delivery. She was pale woman of color, but she was pale, and she was disoriented, and he brought that to their attention. <coughs> they said they had higher priority cases, did not attend to that woman until two hours <coughs> later, at which point, when they entered her abdominal cavity, a gallon of blood poured out and she died of cardiac arrest. There has been proper attention by this body to two other issues, suicides 
and mental health through drug addiction, but I haven't heard about this, although there has been these public statements. And these are cases where these ladies are completely innocent. It's not things they do to themselves. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate you uh, providing us with that uh, wealth of knowledge this morning. I uh, appreciate you so much, uh, Professor Tomaski. Next, we have a couple of uh, <coughs> presentations. We have three this morning. And we'll start off with a Marisco uh, Energy up, uh, Great Update and our Director <coughs> will kick off for us. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. I've invited uh, Cooper Hammerling from Amoresco to provide an update. Yeah. 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 Morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, you're probably used to seeing Jay Lockard up here about this time, our project manager, but his daughter came down with a virus this weekend. So he's uh, he's on dad duty today and staying home with her. Um, so you get me instead. Um, I was the, the engineer during the development phase of the project. So I'll just give a brief update on um, on our construction progress. I can take some questions at the end. If they're very detailed questions about you know exact construction timeframes, I might have to defer to Jay. Um, on, on the next meeting, um, or he can talk to you between that um, and the next time. So, um, sorry. Yes, Jim. Just as, as context, because it's the beginning mm -hmm. of the year, this is sort of a, we do have a new commissioner here. James, sure. can you come back up and give context for those? What is this before we get into the details of an update? Can you give a framework for what we set out to do and where we are? Sure. Um, so, I guess the, the broad overview of this project is an um, energy performance upgrade. Um, where all of the county facilities were audited. There's about 70 facilities in the county. Um, around 40 of them were included in this upgrade list. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, performance measures that are being included in uh, primarily lighting, HVAC, uh, energy controls, water through um, like low flow toilets, urinals, shower heads, things like that. Um, controls for the pool, ice makers, there, there's a lot of different measures that are included. The broad scope of this project is that the energy savings <coughs> provided by all of these low, low energy uh, measures, the savings from the energy costs will pay for the upgrades. So it's, it's a net zero for the county money. Really. So, um, project was approved in the last year or two and we're, we're into that phase now and that's the, the update now. Thank you. Um, so Jay, first of all I want to say that the staff has been extremely accommodating. There have been no access issues. They've had our construction crews have had a very easy time getting into all the buildings they needed to. Um, so that's always appreciated. Um, we're currently on track to have the entire project built by um, the end of August, and that includes all punch list items. Um, lighting, which is probably the most widespread measure in the county, is about 50% done. That's interior and exterior, and the crew, the, our lighting crew is currently working here in the courthouse, so depending on where you are, um, you might see them around here today and the rest of this week. Um, Water is about 75% complete. Um, the new um, fixtures have been completely installed in this building, so if you use any of the restrooms, you'll see the new fixtures there. Um, the building controls, which is the energy management system, that's about 60% complete. And sort of the, I'll say the more tedious measures have been done, like wiring thermostats, the field controllers, <coughs> that stuff has been mostly completed. What's left to do is bring all that back into a central um, campus supervisor and a server, um, and they expect the, um, the county to be able to see their buildings on this new system by mid-February. Um, the largest mechanical measure was the uh, 13 rooftop units at the fire department headquarters. That is scheduled to be installed in mid-February. Um, the irrigation controls, those are going to go in in the spring. Um, ice machines and the VFDs, those have all been installed. Um, and that's, I think that's actually about it. So are there any questions regarding the construction? <coughs> any questions from the Board of Commissioners or comments? Commissioner Robinson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chair. Um, so, uh, say that again. When do you think it's going to be done? Full? So, the, the whole thing should be done by the end of August. Okay. That's everything in? Yes. All, all the count, everything's lined up when we begin yes. to realize our savings. So, 
Contractually, that's when you'll start realizing savings, but also understand that as items are installed, they're currently saving energy now. That's just not part of the contract. Anything that's being saved right now is above and beyond what is contractually, um, or what is what we're obligated to save contractually. So again, I won't belabor this point, James and Jennifer, um, at some point we've got to mark, okay, this is day one for savings, and how do we measure the outcome but what did, did we get there? Did we really get, you know, was it a net net difference? And so, um, so part of the contract is uh, there was a baseline measurement done over the previous three years. And at the one year mark and every year for the next 15 years, uh, that baseline will be compared to that previous year's usage. And the energy cost will either be proven that we saved that much, or if for some reason we do not save the, the promised amount, Amoresco will pay the difference to us. Okay. And that's what I want to keep up with. Get this, get being accountable for what we for contract what you do. We'll, we'll talk, not the labor. I'm good on that one. We'll keep moving for the sake of the meeting. Um, my second and last question regarding this deals with um, um, contractors or subcontractors. Now you you're sort of what uh, what they call what uh, uh, what do they call you guys? We're, we act as the GM or the general or the, sorry, the GC, the general contractor. The general the contractor. Uh, uh, I won't say owner's rep, but in essence, you represent the county mm -hmm. on behalf of this initiative, mm -hmm. and you <coughs> award contracts to fulfill the work. In other words, you don't own the we own the equipment. Mm -hmm. You're just facilitating the transaction and overseeing the installation. Um, how how did you how do you pick? The subcontractors, how, how does that work? Who's responsible for the work? I mean, how, how does that work? Just so, remind me. So as a development engineer, during the development phase, I'll come up with a scope of work and then walk multiple contractors that are capable of performing that scope of work. Um, we always try to get at least three bids per measure. Um, a lot of the times we will, we also look to direct purchase because of our, we're a large enough company nationally that we have um, a certain amount of buying power that we can buy the equipment directly. And so a lot of times we will sub out the labor um, because we don't, you know, we're, a, we're an engineering company. We don't have people on the, we don't actually have electricians on staff that are you know, hooking up these uh, units. Um, and then ultimately, when it does go to construction, um, because generally when I get pricing during the development phase, a lot of subcontractors have a caveat that their pricing is only good for about 90 days after we receive it. So during construction, our project manager, Jay, We'll go to those same companies again and bid it out again to get updated pricing, and then the ultimate final decision is up to our project manager based on kind of the best um, combination of price and quality of the work that they do. Okay, and just to clarify, so in, in Director Peacock and Director Worth, to hear, hear this out, and I know Director Peacock, you're less involved in this process, right? Right. But, but I'm looking for your, your expertise on this. So, all right, they're procuring, they're getting their quotes. Um, to your point, you quoted us a number, for whatever it is for the contract, right? It was guaranteed. Mm -hmm. And let's say you, you you bid out toilets for the sake of the conversation uh, originally. But now here you are a year later, and they're actually coming in. And if those quotes are <coughs> less, do we get the savings? Is that just your margin? Or if it's more, do you, I mean, eat? how does that work? I mean, because again, I'm just curious how the, how the cash flows. I would, I would say in general, if there's money left over in the project, because the, the dollar amount that is paid to us <coughs> remains constant, what we will try to do is do additional work for the county. So we're not, we won't issue a refund check, but if there's you know, items that were left out of the project um, that can be paid for, we will then include those. But that's not part of the guarantee. That's sort of, I'll say, above and beyond um, what's in the contract. Derek Peacock, my final close that out for me. Um, How does that sound? Does that sound reasonable? It does, if there's a way to track it. It's the only thing to, to determine what if there were mm -hmm. any savings uh, and then how they're applied. So any additional work or not, if, that, if it's not in the contract originally, we're not going to guarantee savings on those additional measures. But what will happen is we'll say, hey, we have you know an extra five thousand dollars. You know, we, you know, originally, you know, maybe. Uh, you know, some lights were included that had a poor payback in this building. You want us to just do those. So we, we don't go ahead and do any work without asking, you know, the county first. Okay. Everything is approved by you guys. Uh, but you'll work. <coughs> be back in touch with the James, director. absolutely, yeah. yeah. And he'll be, he'll be some knowledge of what you're doing. Absolutely. Okay. We will not work in any areas without prior notice. I got it. I'm good. I'm telling you. Okay. Commissioner <coughs> Guyton. 
Yes. Um, oh, sorry, sir. No. Oh, sorry. You stated something about the firehouses, uh, the mm -hmm. fire stations, the roofs. On the, uh, the rooftop units. So those are the heating and air conditioning units. Oh, um, units there's okay. 13 units at the fire department headquarters, which are going to be replaced mid-February. Okay, because I, I just heard the roof. <laughs> no, no, no. The, the roof the roof will only be touched as as, as much as it takes to uh, get those new units in place. Um, but we're not replacing the roofs themselves. They appear to be in good condition. All right. Thank you. I'll you back. Okay. Commissioner Thank Mitchell. You. I want to go back to the savings, so I have to make sure I mm -hmm. understand the savings. Yeah. So if there is a savings, for whatever reason, that mm -hmm. you will find additional work to do to offset that savings versus the savings of the savings. I mean, I, I don't, I'm trying to make sure I understand your So your what, what you're saying is savings over what the initial price was? Right, because you got a guarantee. Mm -hmm. you, yeah. you, you're done. So if there's if there's money left over, that will go into additional items, you know, approved by the county outside of the contract. So you can kind of think of them as bonus items that um, we're not going to be we're not going to be guaranteeing savings on them because they're kind of above and beyond what the contract was for. But we're not we're not pocketing the money. Just a little confused. I mean, <coughs> I would, okay, I wouldn't expect a whole lot right now. Right right now, all of the scope is going in basically as promised. There may be a few little That's okay. and dime things just, here and there. Mm -hmm. I think generally what Cooper's saying, okay. so like, um, let's say there's one particular bathroom or something that, or say a light fixture that, that was on the list, they're supposed to change. Well, um, for whatever reason, they can't get that one or we decide not to. We can we can allocate that money to some other energy that savings. savings. Correct. If there was happen to be some savings. Yeah, right. So if there's something promised in the contract that they can't do, we can choose something else for. I don't really expect that to happen much at all, if if at all. But it is an option. Say, for example, we promise 100 or 100 LED fixtures on this floor, okay. but I know some of the fixtures have already been replaced, and maybe between contract signing and now, say 10 of them have already been replaced. Okay. We're not just going to not install those 10 fixtures. We'll just say, hey, we have these 10 extra fixtures. Where would you like us to put them? Because you have already done that that part of the work. But if there's no place to work, to place them, there generally will be. <laughs> there's always a place to put them. Okay, okay. okay. Um, didn't we pull out the pool uh, boundary waters pool out of it? We pulled the out the hypochlorite system, which is right. the the salt generator, right. chlorine generator. Right. So, but the pool itself has a variable frequency drive. It's like a variable speed pumps and stuff is still included. Yeah. And also controls and lighting at that facility, but not uh, just not the chlorine generator. Right. right, right. Okay. I, I, just, I, I was just, I, I, but when you said something about the pool, I was just making sure that. No, it's, it's more the, the, the whole facility. facility I guess. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, outside of that, I think I can hold out and we'll, we'll talk kind of all about the other stuff. And we'll do this again in a couple months. We'll have another one. Yeah. Okay. I yield back. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you so much thank for your you. presentation. Uh, we'll move next to our next presentation, which is um, <coughs> Workforce Development Progress Report. Uh, I requested our Director of Workforce Development, uh, Breezy Stratton, to come in today to give, give the Board of Commissioners an update. Thank you so much, Breezy, for being here. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right, thank you all for uh, allowing me to come today to give you an update on workforce development in Douglas County. Um, as you will see on the slide, we have a new branding as part of our community and economic development strategic plan. Um, workforce got its own brand, um, work outside the lines. So um, I am uh, an employee of the Economic Development Authority, but do workforce development on behalf of all of Douglas County. So to start off, um, I think it's important that we know why we do this and why workforce development is essential to economic development. As we have um, moved forward working with industries, a lot of the work that we do centers around human capital and whether they can find viable, trained employees to meet their needs so that they can grow and thrive here in Douglas County. So in economic development, you hear a lot about the recruitment of industries to our community. And oftentimes, the work that we do to support our existing industries is not um, as notable 
but about 70% of what we do actually in the authority is centered around supporting and helping our existing industries grow and thrive. So um, by focusing on workforce development efforts, we not only help our local businesses find trained, qualified employees, allowing them to grow and thrive in our community and stay competitive within their industry, but we also help the residents of Douglas County access quality jobs and thereby raising the median household income and decreasing the poverty rate. By partnering with education systems, we are able to align career paths with required training opportunities and skill sets, ultimately decreasing the number of adults who do not meet the minimum requirements for the majority of quality jobs. So the what of this are the three measurables that we use. So we understand in, in our office that we do not have direct impact on these things, but if we do what we are supposed to do and what's outlined in the strategic plan, then our effort should work to increase the median household income, reduce the poverty rate, and reduce the percentage of adults, which is classified as 25 years or older, who do not have a high school diploma or GED. So the uh, measurable that we use is the Metro Atlanta matrix. So currently, Metro Atlanta has a median household income of just above $63,000. Our goal is to make sure that our median income, we are working to increase ours as well to be above that. Poverty rate, 12.12 in Metro Atlanta. Ours is currently 13.48. I should note that is an incredible decline. Um, as of 2013, our poverty rate was at 20%. Last year, it was at 14.7. So 2007, it was at 14.7. 2018 um, was at 13.48. So we measure that every year using um, data that we get from a subscription service that we have. So that is one of those things. And then percentage of 25 year olds um, without a high school diploma. So you'll see about 11% of our population is 25, that are 25 years or older do not meet the minimum requirements. In order to get a quality job in most industries, the minimum is a GED or a high school diploma. So those are kind of the black and white benchmarks that we assess and and keep in mind as we then strategize on programs and strategies in order to, again, increase median household income, reduce poverty rate, and reduce the percentage of adults. <coughs> so the how, that's how we do it. Employee engage, employer engagement. So we meet with industries here in Douglas County, daily almost. Um, <coughs> those industries could be small business owners that um, need to hire one person but want to know how to do that most effectively instead of just talking to someone and say, I would like to hire someone. But then we meet with the large industries on um, a quarterly basis to make sure that the strategies that we're putting in place will actually impact what they, their bottom line. Um, we host events to bring the industries together. So a lot of times you'll hear about business to business. Ours is a little different. It's about HR directors meeting with HR directors or decision makers, key decision makers within the company meeting with others to make sure that the wages align, that you know they're paying a livable wage because if they're having mass turnover, there could be a reason and that could be that they're paying several dollars less than the competitor for the same job across the street and they don't know that until they talk to one another. Um, so employer engagement is key. All of our workforce development efforts are done from the perspective of the employer. So while we are working to help the residents of Douglas County access these quality jobs, we are working with the employers in order to make that happen. And then we create partnerships with other organizations within Douglas County to meet the resident side of it. So our office acts, um, I like to say, as a conduit between the businesses and the organizations that um, meet with the residents in order to make sure that all resources and, um, are aligned together for the effort of increasing uh, trained and qualified workforce for the employers. So the partnerships include the school system, obviously, for that future pipeline, making sure that what students are learning in their high schools through their CTAE courses or at the CCI will directly relate with the in-demand careers here in Douglas County, or that they are um, learning skill sets, if that career doesn't exist here, that they are at least <coughs> learning nationally recognized uh, skill sets that will take them where they should go. 
Um, we work with the criminal justice system. Uh, so we are, have partnerships with the accountability courts to ensure that individuals who are part of our accountability courts can access federal workforce dollars, which are known as WIOA, or Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act funding, so that they can get training for in-demand careers here in Douglas County. And that is part of the five-phase um, program with the accountability courts. We also work with the Atlanta Regional Commission's Career Resource Center. They are the ones that have the Career Resource Center on Club Drive. They help um, individuals become WIOA eligible, so that's kind of the central entry point for all workforce development funding in Douglas County for training purposes. Um, Douglas County Libraries, <laughs> Lindy's over here. So we have worked with um, our libraries to use Goodwill of North Georgia dollars in order to um, create kind of an annexed uh, Goodwill training center here um, through their Career Connector. We are also partnering with the libraries to host some training courses. So um, that has been a great partnership. The Metro Atlanta um, Exchange for Workforce Solutions is a regional partnership where we get together with all the other counties as part of um, the Metro Atlanta Chamber or the United Way Career Rise and talk about specific strategies we can do as a region in order to grow our workforce here because while we worry about Douglas County and I am Douglas County centric, individuals in our county who are looking for careers may <coughs> not, they, they don't really care about the jurisdictional line. So if we can make sure that as a region, we are all on the same page talking about training, talking about how to use federal funding appropriately, then it works for everyone. <coughs> And then um, National Skills Coalition has a organization called Business Leaders United and it is a policy focused um, organization committee, if you will, that focuses on making sure that federal and state policy do not impede employers from hiring people. Um, and those could be people with mitigating circumstances like a criminal record or those without a GED or just individuals who don't typically understand how to access careers or know where to go. Um, many employers have moved to an online onboarding process and we still have individuals who want to go and meet someone face to face and have, um, you know, hand in a paper application. So bridging that gap between an employer wanting to be completely online and an individual saying, well, I feel like if they could meet me, then I would have a better opportunity at the career. So. Um, we do, a, and a lot of that actually comes back to the employer engagement. We host two career fairs a year. Um, this year will be in March and September at the Douglasville Conference Center, and we're partnering with United Way to also host the nonprofits that work in the workforce development space to be there because if someone is looking for a career, they are likely looking for community resources to help them during this time. And so bridging that gap to make sure that our citizens have the support or know where to go to get the support that they need. And last, oh, not lastly, our programs, we are kicking off a construction program. The Home Builders Association has come to us uh, last year to talk about their need for trained uh, workers. Um, and so in doing some research, I learned that we have an organization, a statewide organization called Construction Education Foundation of Georgia, better known as SEFCA. They have um, a nationally accredited Pro training program called Construction Ready, and Douglas County will be the fifth location to <coughs> offer this program. It's a four-week program. Individuals um, apply. It is funded through federal workforce dollars, and they come out with eight different certifications, one of them being Utility Flagger. And so in talking with our utility companies, they need that certification for their baseline uh, entry-level positions, and that is something they would have to offer their employee. So coming to it, an individual coming to them for an entry-level position that already has that certification already has a foot in the door and a leg up. So that's the kind of programs we're putting in place. So again, the Home Builders Associ Association came to us with a need. We worked through our channels to find a solution, and now we have a program starting. We are doing that as well in manufacturing. Um, industrial maintenance technology is one of the key critical uh, positions that is needed in Douglas County and we currently do not have a, a mechanism to train individuals in that because our technical college does not offer that program here locally. So we are working to build a program here that our, our citizens 
could take advantage of and with the employer partnerships we guarantee interviews so those are the kind of programs we put in place in order to give our residents a leg up but also to ensure that our businesses have that trained qualified workforce so that they meet their needs so that they grow and thrive and hire more individuals in our community um, and then we do awareness campaigns so I, I talked a lot about more of the blue collar type programs but what we hear a lot is well are there any engineer positions in Douglas County absolutely we have positions all white collar positions are found here in our community oftentimes there's not as many job openings in their fields because they may only need one chemical engineer or one um, mechanical engineer but if we highlight those available career options in our community whether they're open or not when they become open maybe our residents will start looking locally for their jobs instead of automatically looking <coughs> into downtown Atlanta for a position so we're kicking off a work where you live campaign which will highlight positions available here in Douglas County so that we can grow our own here because all of the research says individuals who live and work in their same community become more invested and engaged in their community in their local government and their school systems in the nonprofits so we are trying to build our own and stop that exporting of our citizens into downtown for work and importing individuals from other communities into our community for working we want a little more balance there um, and we will be sharing more workforce data using social media as a campaign as well and that's the end and there's the end. Reason, first of all, I would like to thank you for just embracing the concept of and the importance of workforce development. Me and you've had some extensive conversations and you've taken my vision and your vision and this county's vision and moved it forward with preparing us because that workforce development and uh, workforce readiness is key to economic development. We can preach that all day long, but if you don't have the staff or the people trained or the skill set, it's a moot point. So thank you and I appreciate you. Board of Commissioners, have any comments or questions for uh, Daisy? Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, I saw your hand first, and then Commissioner Biden, I'm sorry. I'll give a second. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Very good presentation, woman at my own heart. I, I appreciate that type of presentation. I, I get it. Um, you know, the, over the past 10 years, I mean, especially coming through that recession, it, it, we talked about this Board of Commissioners, especially. Um, Commissioner Mitchell and Commissioner Guyton, we talked about small business. We talked about it was all about the economy. We talked about it was about jobs. But the, but our external partners outside of the county weren't ready. Their minds weren't expanded enough to be able to like, okay, guys, we don't get our minds around this. We're going to get stuck. Um, but since you've come on board and Chris Pumphrey's come on board and really economic development has really sort of taken a, a become a catalyst for the county, I've seen them. I've seen the shift. And, and so thinking about 2013, I said, yeah, that's about right. Here's my point. So you talked about your outcomes are poverty, income, and what was that last one? Um, individuals 25 years and older that do uh -huh. not have a GED or high school diploma. All right, so to, 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 to move poverty from what, 20-something percent to 14 percent, right? What, 13? Mm -hmm. was, was that the number? Mm -hmm. To move that type of pop, to move poverty rate at a county level was like, okay, you can't develop enough people fast enough for that. So that would have had to be what migration of people in to be able to have enough income to push the poverty rate down. You wouldn't be able to develop enough people <coughs> to make more money, and not at that rate based on um, income has been stagnant across the nation, right? For the most part, right? Income levels haven't really risen. All things been equal. So I'm, I'm, I'm just peeling back what I'm listening to, and I'm like, okay. So my conclusion is like, what, do, what is the time frame from the time, what is the time frame in which we can really begin to, I hear what we're doing, but how will we, like, in what time frame will we get measurement? That's the first question. Uh, will we really know the effects of this? Two, how many people have gone through these, I mean, how do you quantify this just for even us, like, is it one or two or five people? So I'm always putting things in the context of 150,000, no, 150,000 people. Right, so I'm trying to say, okay, so how, how, where is this being impacted? And then tying this back to the number of employers here. I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to, I'm hearing the words, but I'm trying to quantify as you know I do. So, I'm, so can you just answer those yes. two and I'll have one final question. Okay, so the first thing that we should recognize is through our research, we have learned that Douglas County does not have an unemployment property, uh, problem. Our issue is that we have a population of people that are so incredibly underemployed 
that they are still qualified as being in poverty. So the training programs that we are developing are the ones that will take someone who is currently working in a part-time position or in a position at 30 hours or less, not making a family sustaining wage, giving them the training needed and that they, first of all, they take an assessment that measures their aptitude and their interests. So we're not telling folks you must go into this construction field. It's you assess based on your assessment this seems like a field that would be great for you based on your skill set and your interests. Here is now a training program in which you will go into where we have employer partners on the end of it that will then give you a shot. So we are trying to take individuals that are currently working, but just in, an, in a system or in an industry that is still not paying a family sustaining wage. So they are not able to move forward and get themselves or their family out of poverty. So when you talk about measurables, research states that a healthy community has a poverty rate of 10% or less. Now we know the data, often what you see here, we did just come out of a recession. Everything says that this stuff, a lot of the decrease in poverty would have happened organically anyways because our economy has improved. But what we have also learned is that through the strategy, we did have an influx of educated individuals move into Douglas County in the past five years. Our young professional population has grown. We have um, individuals 25 to 45 years old, uh, have 25.7% of them have a college degree and are working um, in a career that will improve that. So Douglas County has done a great job at attracting individuals into our community that has helped us raise our median income and help to decrease that poverty level. Mm -hmm. What our focus is, part of the strategy, there's a recommendation that says, we have a focused effort on the underserved populations of Douglas County. Those individuals who through this growth and through the, through the uh, recruitment of educated individuals of our county have been left behind. And so we are taking an effort to make sure that they are no longer left behind. That we, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. So we, that's where our focus is, Commissioner Robinson, is that the measurables are, you know, and, and to get to your point, how many people? So we limit the classes to 20 individuals. So the, the Construction Ready Program, the first go round, will have 20 individuals in it. Now that may not seem like a lot, but through research, that is a optimal class size for A, them to get individualized instruction, to get the help that they need, and to also have the networking opportunities. <clears throat> it's also the right class size for the employers to not feel overwhelmed so that they can meet and engage with the participants in the class in a meaningful way so that they can get hired. SEPCO was founded in 2014 as part of the Arthur Blank Foundation's mission to grow or to build the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. So Westside Works is its first location. It's now at the Aerotropolis, in Clayton County, and in Smyrna. Douglas County, again, will be the fifth one. They have hired, or they have trained almost 800 people and have 95.6% placement rate. After six months, that placement rate is still 88%. So this is a proven training program that works for this industry, and we are using it as a model to take it into our other key industry sectors, which advanced manufacturing is one of them. You're, you're good. I, I, Thank you. I, that was fine. And I'll, I'll, <laughs> no, no, I got it. No, 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 no. I, I, I try to keep it going. For I know my, you my like peers. the data, too. Yeah, yeah. No, all right. So my, and then my last question was, was to, to your point. Thank you for covering what I thought was people migrated in. I, I, there was no way you could have gotten it through no. you know, one-on-one. -on -one. So, I, all right, I got that. Um, but you, you, it, it's um, federal and state dollars. And this, we always get this for the citizens. This is more for okay. you know, um, it, you know, we give tax abatements. We do things for big business, and it's always like, but what does our citizens get out of this? Like, what is the exchange? Um, anywhere from 500 to to 50 jobs, we may get. Um, you know, again, and, and so there's always this. What, what is the exchange? And I, it sounds like um, there's federal and state dollars. There's a there's sort of like this good corporate citizen that. This is what you should do, right? Because, I, and, and I, I have to say this at least for, for my district and what I'm looking at when I listen to this. I'm like, okay, I get what this is for. This is not for everyone. 
This is, to your point, a select po population. We're trying to bring people out of poverty. So you've got these big corporations that are, well, relatively speaking, you have corporations that benefit from taxpayer dollars. And so it's now being cast back into the community to ensure that they also participate in this benefit some kind of way and that everybody lives. If they get it, if they get some type of benefit from lower taxation or abated taxes, therefore those people who are paying taxes, regardless of whether they pay sales tax or homeowner taxes, it doesn't really matter. Do they get something out of this? And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm listening. And, and so am I. So with that, that okay, I get it, um, and I, and I get um, it, it. It's part of the process. And I think the key thing is that. Economic development is not being responsible for it. You're a conduit to assure we're, we're harnessing all the resources in the county that make this work. Is that right? Is, is that what I'm listening to? Yes. Yeah, so the idea behind having a centralized workforce development strategy and a dedicated paid staff person that it's not volunteer led is so that all entities that may work in the workforce development space yes. are all on one page, singing from the same hymn book, and that we are all in our various networks and avenues of people disseminating the same information out about workforce development in Douglas County whether that be the available positions to your point of the new companies coming in or how we're working with our existing industries to expand their operations making sure that we are aware of those available jobs um, the number one job here in Douglas County is still an RN we but the problem why, or one of the reasons is that we have limited training opportunities just because of the qualified trainers in nursing. So we are working with our educational partners um, to develop more RN programs here so that we can meet that need. So it's not just, you know, we're working in healthcare, IT, um, logistics distribution, manufacturing, construction, public safety, um, working with the fire chief and police chief and sheriff's department to ensure that you know they all have a shortage when it comes to hiring people and to go into their fields we host um, career expos for our ninth graders so before they choose their career path in the high school they are exposed to all of the available um, careers in our community that's coming up february 1st um, for the spring semester and so it's a it's a plethora of, of things and the reason we do it and the reason we have this one person here doing it, which is me, is to make sure that it's a coordinated effort, that we aren't working in silos anymore. Okay, and I, I thank you, Ma'am Chair, in the sense that you, you, you talked about campaign and awareness and all that you're doing, and I'm sitting here as the district commissioner, like, well, that's good to know. How do I get plugged into that? Like, so will there be some type of way of integrating all that you're saying, not just um, our director of communication sending out a press release say, hey, by the way, we got this workforce development program, but a true integrated communication strategy with our, pro I mean, I, we got a new committee. I mean, Madam Chair, I, I know I, I'm hearing y'all have this vision. I'm trying to plug into it. So can we just assure that there's this integrated in our new communication? Yes. So me coming here today is because 2019 is our kickoff year. Uh, so as the Community and Economic Development Strategic Plan yep. was rolled out, we, the, as you know, in August, we rolled out the community branding campaign, which was the work outside the lines, live outside the lines campaign. So 2019 is our year to roll out these initiatives. So yes, there's a coordinated effort. We're working with a multitude of, of uh, players to make sure that we have a new website that's coming online this year. We have you know newsletters, the social media aspect. Mm -hmm. Um, Rick and I are working on making sure that Douglas County happenings, that there's always something in there to talk about the workforce effort so that as many folks within our community are aware of what we're doing and can get engaged in some way. Yeah, no, Madam Chair, you. Okay. Awesome. And my February call up will be related to workforce development here in Douglas County and the Chapel Hill News and Views. Oh, okay. All right, Commissioner Guider had a comment. Yes, yeah, Tracy, I was going to ask do you have a website? And <laughs> how does someone out there that may be new to the community, how do they get plugged into some of these training or this education program? So, currently, because of our website and its limited capacity at the moment while it's being uh, redone, rebuilt, re everything. Um, we are using our Facebook page for the majority of it. So if you just look on Facebook, Develop Douglas is the Development Authority's Facebook page and we post all of the things there. And again, Rick and I are working on um, a more concerted effort to make sure that our efforts are streamlined as well. Well, uh, are you not gonna be plugged into our uh, website? Maybe just a you know, page on our website? Um, I believe the effort is to maybe have links 
to, to where if they want workforce development, it'll link back to our website so that um, the, the information is always current. It's hard if you have multiple websites doing the same thing to maintain um, continuity and also updating, so it's better if you have one website that consistently is updated and the rest of the websites just link back to it. Okay, because I was going to put this in a newsletter yes. and send it out to my well, constituents, I'm, but it's, you, we have to go through Facebook right now. Well, yes, or um, right now, but that won't be for very long. Could you let us know? Yes, so absolutely. Uh, yes, we. Can. There will probably be a big announcement about the website coming out and all of those things. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yes. And you're back. Commissioner the, Mitchell. Just uh, <coughs> class of 2012. Good job. Um, <laughs> with that being said, <laughs> leadership Douglas for those of you. With that being said, though, uh, work outside the line, which I, I'm, I'm glad to know that that. Job well done, and, and, and this presentation was absolutely excellent. Are we also making sure that we don't lose focus on what I call workforce housing for those that you know kind of work close, work within the area, and uh, you know if you kind of we talk about if you work in this in the area where you live and play and all the other good stuff, that's a benefactor, uh, not affordable housing, no. but workforce housing. Um, so that is not my realm of focus, the housing. So I might defer to Chris, um, the, our executive director about housing. Uh, <laughs> put you on the spot. Okay. Thank you, please. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, to, to your point, uh, the Department of Community Affairs has a program uh, that they work uh, with the developers in providing a tax credit to provide workforce housing. Right. Um, and that housing could be for your teachers, your police officers, your firefighters, you know, folks that work in that space. Um, it is something that, you know, a lot of those developments are very attractive. They're, for the most part, typically apartments. Um, we just know we've had some resistance to, to those types of developments here locally. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, but so it, you think it's more of an apartment than workforce housing? Most of most of the, the developers that we've seen have been in on the apartment okay. side. Okay. Um, so like your Walton communities, okay. um, they they all do them. Um, there, there's a number around the, the state, you know, who, who do that. But they're, they're really nice. Only only difference in there is that there is a tax credit that allows that developer to basically offer the rent at a rate that fits within that income level yes, for right. the mm -hmm. teachers and what have you. Right. Uh, we all, we did hear from our uh, school superintendent that he does, that they school. definitely have a need okay. uh, for that type of housing because they want to keep their teachers here in Douglas County and providing them opportunities to live here and they're having challenges with that. Okay. So at least you're <coughs> there, but I didn't realize it was more of um, uh, apartment living. But mm -hmm. housing is housing, that's, that's okay. And, and last but not least, you, you spoke about, a, not you, Chris, I'm yes. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you spoke about a, a March and a September mm -hmm. career day. Yes, I brought the flyer, but I believe it's March 12th and September 11th. Okay. And it is a career and community <coughs> resource ex, or fair. Mm -hmm. career, I have so many things, but career and community resource fair. And it's at the Douglasville Conference Center okay. from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. And um, we are attract. We have committed employers to be there, and in order for an employer to come, they have to have an open position, so they can't just come and take resumes. They have to be there. We do offer um, on-site interviewing space for the employer, but then we have allocated ten vendor spaces for our nonprofits that specifically work in the workforce space. So United Way and Talatuna, those type organizations who can. Um, sometimes there's a gap. When someone is looking for, they work in an industry right now and they don't make a family sustaining wage and they want to go get a new job or a new, start a career, there's sometimes a gap where they need some assistance to just overcome some of those day one obstacles, whether it be um, you know, $100 work boots because they have to have steel toe boots to go into there right. or those kind of things. So we're partnering with organizations that can meet those obstacles so that if they find a career that they are interested in but there are some of those obstacles we can directly refer them to you know this table to help them and then we're also bringing our educational partners um, so all of them will have a table a vendor space at the event so that in individuals who are interested in going to get a certificate diploma associate's degree bachelor's degree master's degree um, 
or just an industry recognized credential, we will be able to lead them into that space. Um, <laughs> And you do acknowledge to, to those employers uh, about a possible tax credit by hiring Douglas Williams. Uh, so if they are on our tax incentive plan, mm -hmm. most of them have um, an have a recommendation to hire 30 percent, and we track that. Yeah. Um, they send us their zip code list each yeah. year okay. as part of the compliance effort. So yes, it's just. Um, We've got to get our workforce trained. And there's Understood. there's been a gap between the awareness of the available jobs, mm -hmm. and a lot of that has been employer education. So mm -hmm. we had employers who were listing their jobs as being in Atlanta and wondering why they didn't get a lot of applicants locally. And so by simply having a conversation of, if you're posting it on Indeed.com, why don't you list that you're in Lithia Springs or in Douglasville as opposed to Atlanta mm -hmm. so you can weed out, you know, you just put yourself in a really big, pot yes. where you could be in a little smaller pot if mm -hmm. you would put the city you're in and a lot of those postings actually come from wherever their headquarters are mm -hmm. um, so they call it their Atlanta location mm -hmm. when in fact it's Lithia Springs so a lot of it was just part of that employer engagement and having those conversations mm -hmm. and they've seen an uptick of local residents mm -hmm. applying for their open positions thank you you're very welcome uh, I yield. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you, Commissioner Carpenter. Yes, ma'am. I have a great presentation. Thank you. And absolutely wonderful. Um, a couple of questions for you. When it comes to the soft skills, mm -hmm. um, being in an industry where soft skills are a huge thing, mm -hmm. people will have the, the skill set, but then they won't have the soft skills. How do you guys help them to manage that, especially when, you, when you're saying, you know, we're going to help? the underemployed population, their soft skills are really what, what makes or breaks them in a lot of ways. So, um, because the training pro programs are all federally funded through Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act dollars, um, one requirement is that 25% um, of all training is included in soft skills. So they, and, and ours have taken it a step forth, further, we have built in um, financial literacy as a soft skill component uh, also, they are, we have drug testing, even if the employer, if one employer says, oh, we don't really do it, we include that and we include some counseling around that if um, they have had issues in the past. So our soft skills go from effective communication, time management, conflict resolution, um, financial literacy, all of those things because in meeting again with the employers, they say, well, you know, they come to us with a relatively, you know, you say they have the aptitude to do this, we'll send them to training for the technical skills. Well, we need them to show up. They need to understand that they have to be here every day on time. And so, again, it is federally mandated that 25% of the curriculum is dedicated to soft skills. Um, we use employers also. Our employers come in and teach resume writing. So an HR director from a local company comes in and teaches resume writing so that they get that interaction. Um, it's a little different, every community is different, but but that's kind of what we do here when it comes to soft skills. And we start that even, we have a high school program that we roll out um, where we target the high school students who are not going to college, meaning they have not taken the ACT or SAT and they have not requested an official transcript to be sent to any institution of higher education upon conferment of their diploma. We target them, so <coughs> we're right in the middle of that. Last year we took 130 high school seniors who were on track to graduate on industry tours and 31 of them came into our program, 24 of them graduated, and they graduated with full-time jobs with an average hourly wage of $13.24. So part of that program is that they get those soft skills. Half of it soft skills, half of it was technical skills. So our efforts are very um, targeted to certain populations, especially on the high school side, but soft skills are by and large the number one thing that our employers come to us about as well. So. That is integrated into all of the training programs. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you ask? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, real quick, and I, want, I just want to double back on you talked about housing. Um, well, I don't want to get ahead of it. I'll, I'll, I'll wait to the committee. Yes. yes. But I, I, I want to acknowledge Chris Pumphrey's point um, about housing here in Douglas County. Um, and, um, and and I heard Commissioner Mitchell's comment about uh, affordability, and, and it's it's a policy question that we've sort of evaded, at least the time I've been here. 
uh, which is I go back to when I first came in office, you know, three acre minimums, uh, 1,800 square feet, three sided brick, and the target price of four to five hundred thousand dollars. That was the entry point. So I'm, I'm getting context to when you came into, onto this board. What was the conversation? Now there's been a shift to recognize, like, because that 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 policy position says, okay, you can work for us, but you can't live amongst us, right? You, you, you couldn't get there, right? In other words, that was such a standard, like, okay, you can't come into our community because you had this, this sort of exclusive viewpoint. I mean, it never went anywhere. You know, we sort of defeated that, but it was more of a, so now there's an opening for a different policy position. So now I'm hearing affordability, but I don't, I'm not gonna shy away from, okay, how do you, how do you translate all of that into a very simple policy. And I'm, I'm, uh, Madam Chair has appointed me to a, a, a committee chair to oversee housing, specifically in Douglas County, right? You can't run from that. So what is that? When I hear federal dollars and state dollars, I'm like, okay, y'all know what y'all listening to? Do you understand and you, you know that, oh, like, are you listening, like committee structure, do you know what you're listening to? And, and this is one that's like, okay, this is gonna require some, to fulfill economic development, and to keep the teachers and all that, like, okay, yes, and I'm gonna give you just one story. I grew up on Washington Road off of 285 when I moved here in 1977. My mother moved here, she got a job in the Department of Education and stuff. I used to have to walk four, walk four miles down the street to, uh, there was no school buses at that time, there was no MARTA out there at that time on Washington Road, and Camp Creek had not been cut through yet to Thornton Road. And I give you context of that, and, and, but in that area, all the way washed down Washington Road from uh, I-29 Roosevelt Highway, all the way down to Camp Creek and making a right onto like an L shape. There were 18 apartment complexes. Literally, that was the place to be. And I went to a very small high school. It was basically 98 of us graduated. The Lakeshore High School, which is now West Lake across the river. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm giving you context. And I asked a couple of commissioners that were in office during that time. I said, how did y'all get away with building that many apartments in that strip. I mean, it, was, it, was, it was a big deal. They said it was workforce development because the airport was there and they needed to have housing for the airline stewardess from Easter Airline and so forth. The pilots were all down south and fed, whatever, you know, playing golf. And it was a conversation, I was like, oh, because I'm always about history. I'm like, okay, how did that happen? How do we get there? Now, I'm not suggesting that that, but, but you can't, I mean, I'm hearing this little shy conversation about like, okay, guys, we got an LCI down on Fairburn Road. We, we, we got to have a balanced policy that has a, a, a balanced portfolio of housing options, just like mobility options. And I'm sure I'm just sort of setting, setting the stage for 19 mm -hmm. about uh, it's inclusive. Mm -hmm. It can't be exclusive policy around housing or mobility. It has to be one which like, okay, no, we see a little bit of everybody. And so I, I'm just trying to sort of, you know, at least take a position on, uh, we got to look at it and make sure that it's balanced and it's considerate. And, but, but not run from the fact that we need to make sure that it, it is in there and we're just not trying to slip something in there. You know, set, set the same expectations on what this is. Everybody come to the table and talk about this, but I just want to make sure we're clear. Okay. I yield. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you Thanks so much, guys. Director. Uh -huh. That's right, and we appreciate your wonderful presentation this morning. Last but not least, we have a third presentation, uh, and it's regarding animal control updates, and it's by our very own Director of uh, Douglas County Animal Services, Francis McMillan. Hi, everybody. Hey. Hello. Good morning. This is our new lovely Animal Services building. And um, with this building, we've had a lot of success and we've had some challenges. So I want to talk a minute about some trends we have. This is um, going back to 2012. Uh, which is when we really started looking at um, how to save animals in our animal shelter and um, to manage our influx of animals and um, strengthen our adoption programs. Uh, as you see, when we moved into the new building, we had some uptake. We, we went down with a lot of management, um, intake management, and um, strong adoption programs. And then as you see, we're, we're going up. And um, we hope this trend doesn't hold true, but um, this is the second year in a row we've had more. And it's changing the type of animals we have. Um, 
in prior years we had more puppies and kittens which were easier to adopt out and now we're seeing more adult animals and feral cats. Uh, so this year we took in 3,318 animals. Um, at the end of uh, 2017 we had 123 animals in the shelter at the end of 2018 we had 181. So we're housing about 47 percent more uh, from when we were in the old shelter and even from when we moved into the new shelter. So 2018, um, our biggest population of our animals uh, were adopted out at 44%. Uh, return to owners is uh, high um, for the um, area we're in at 20% and we've uh, implemented some new programs to help with that. 16% of our animals go out to rescue and uh, then others we have unfortunately uh, dead on arrival that we pick up um, which is only 3% of the animals we pick up and 2% which is industry standard dying house that would be uh, usually young kittens or puppies uh, that are born into the shelter and they don't survive. So something we look at in the animal services science uh, is our live release rate. Right now it, we're at 88%. Uh, we had a total of 1,081 cats uh, adopted or, or sent out to rescue or returned to the owners. And we had a total of 1,683 dogs that made it out. Um, so 6% of our dogs get euthanized and 19% of our cats are euthanized. And that's due to a large part of the high feral cat intake, uh, which are more difficult to adopt out. So we did euthanize 391 animals this year. Uh, when we euthanize an animal, it's because uh, it is unadoptable. And we try to strive to be no-kill. And what it takes to be a no-kill organization is just uh, euthanizing animals that are suffering from uncomfortable conditions, like they're dangerous. Um, we do have some court ordered euthanization. Um, animals that are not able to be rehabilitated are euthanized. Um, so we will try to keep our live release rate up to 90%. We didn't quite make the mark this year, but that's what it takes to become a no kill facility. Um, no kill facilities do euthanize, contrary to popular belief, but they try to keep their live release rate at 90%. Um, it is our policy that we consider euthanasia only when a veterinarian or behavioral exam determines that an animal's condition is untreatable and the animal has little to no chance of an acceptable quality of life. Our strategy for a high live release rate is a strong adoption program, high return to owner rates, a flexible housing within the shelter, solutions for our community cats, which are feral cats, intake prevention and safety net programs. We've implemented a strong adoption programs. Um, we use a questionnaire instead of an application. Um, the questionnaire is used for matching purposes to match the best pet to the citizen. Um, they're assisted by trained counselors. Uh, we have resources available at the shelter for citizens as well as adopters for basic pet care information. Our adoptions include the vaccines and spay and neuter if the funding is available. Our spay and neuter is funded by grants and donations through the public and through the Humane Society. Um, we give them resources for vet care and training. Uh, 60 day no pressure returns. Uh, sometimes a pet's just not a good match for a family. So we allow that pet to be returned within 60 days. This gives enough time for a pet to acclimate to its new environment. Uh, if the pet doesn't work out, we assist the citizen into selecting a new pet. And we also have outreach programs. Uh, the outreach programs are basically adoption events and we go to schools and provide counseling to um, young people on the care of animals. Our high own return to owner rates, um, one of the best things we implemented was um, lost pets can't call home. If your pet is uh, has a Rabies vaccination tag on is microchipped, and we pick it out in the field. And the officer has the ability to trace that information, call the owner, and deliver the pet back home and provide counseling as to why the pet is running at large. This works very well, and we've had a low um, rate of repeat offenders 
with this. If we do have repeat offenders, uh, then we can go into uh, tickets and uh, you know enforcing the ordinances. Citizens may now report their lost pet online. So this is on our Celebrate Douglas County uh, website under the animal shelter, and there's a link you can click and it allows us to look at all the pets in the shelter as well as assist them to make an account and file their lost or pet upload photos and information. It also gives them matches within our system. Uh, it also gives us matches on our end as well. So when we pick up an animal, um, our system will flag it as saying, hey, this is a similar animal that was picked up. And this should allow our return to owner rates go up. Uh, tremendously this year because it'll be more efficient. Uh, you can, three o'clock in the morning, you lost your dog, you can go online and see if it's in our shelter. Uh, that does update approximately every four hours, so it's very close to real time. One of the things that we do in the shelter is a lot of our rooms are flexible housing. Uh, with the in influx of animals, we don't know if we're going to get puppies or kittens, um, you know, more cats, more dogs. So a lot of our cages are on wheels and can be rolled from location, one location to the other, allowing rooms to be flipped. Even some of our interview rooms uh, were utilized this winter when we had a high intake of small dogs. Uh, we had like 25 small dogs at one time. Our puppy room holds 16. Uh, so we were able to use one of our visitation rooms as a flex room and roll the cages in. Should we continue to have these uh, trends with uh, influxes, higher influxes of animals, we can purchase more small cages um, in larger cages that can be rolled around to help us with um, the unexpected inflow. Um, another thing we could do in the future if we continue to have an influx of large animals, uh, there are large folding dog kennels that can be purchased and they can be folded up against the wall when they're not used so this would allow us to fold these cages up against the wall if we didn't have large animals and roll in the small animal cages and allow us to be even more flexible. One way we can get our euthanasia rate down and our live release rate up is um, solutions for community cats. Uh, community cat programs promote and implement trap, neuter, and return in the county to keep stray uh, ownerless cats safe and healthy and out of the shelter. Um, these cats are living in our community now. The only difference between them living there now and under a community cat program would be that they would be vetted and vaccinated and spayed and neutered and they wouldn't be reproducing. When you take a community cat out of the community and you euthanize it, there's a vacuum effect. The other cats breed more and they just replace the cat or new cats move into that territory. Um, Ordinances are needed and recommended to help with community cats, and that's free roaming cat lack and evidence of ownership that may or may not be cared for by one or more residences in the community. And what we would look for would be cats that are, are healthy, um, have them vetted, and send them back out to caretakers in the communities, microchip them so we can track them, and uh, that would keep them out of the shelter. Uh, several different counties around us uh, use these programs. Pollen County being the most recent, mm -hmm. uh, just enacted ordinances for community cat program. Best <coughs> Friends has uh, helped us. Uh, they have had uh, ordinances written by their attorneys uh, that we can review and see if it's something we can adapt for the county for use here. Uh, Carroll County's been doing it for a couple of years now. They have good success. Cobb County started within the last couple of years, and DeKalb and uh, Fulton have been doing it under Lifeline for quite a while now. But um, Jacksonville, City of Jacksonville was one of the first pilot programs for this, um, and it was successful there. So if um, we're interested in doing a community cap program, which would help get our live release rate up, um, we have uh, the ordinances available for your review, uh, should we decide to take that route. Another thing that helps us with um, our live release rate is intake prevention and safety net programs. We have started um, giving a list of rescues to owners that want to surrender their animals to the shelter uh, to help them place the animals themselves, giving them tips 
We also use our Facebook page to help them rehome their animals so animals don't have to go in the shelter. We keep a list of individuals that are looking for animals and we let them know that we have animals for rehome in the shelter. So if you come in and visit the shelter and we don't have what you what you need, your match there, uh, you can check our Facebook page for animals that are being rehomed. Um, another safety net program is uh, Douglas County Humane Society helps provide food for pets through the pet pantry and we call it keeping pets and people together. So if you have um, a mishap, uh, you lost your job, and you're just having a harder time financially, uh, the pet program is there to help feed your pet. Um, we feed uh, pets for seniors to help keep them in their home. That's the biggest thing when seniors call, they're like, I've got to give up my pet, I can't afford to feed it anymore. So we're able to keep their pets in their home with them. Um, we also provide citizens with resources uh, for low cost spay and neuter. Uh, the Humane Society has a program to help with low cost spay and neuter on a limited basis. Uh, we send people to Georgia Spot Society for resources, Well Pet Humane, and Well Pet Humane, um, the uh, owners of that organization just gave the Humane Society $3,000 to help with uh, spay and neuter of animals in our shelter. Um, pet Bull Rescue Central for um, people that have pit bulls that they want to rehome. Um, that's a good resource for us. Uh, Fix Georgia Pets, uh, that's online, and West Georgia Spay Neuter Clinic. Uh, they help us with uh, programs to help um, fix our animals. They're very low cost, and we send citizens there. And the Humane Society also has a program for them to help um, pay a lower fee if you can uh, apply for the program, and that helps get your animals fixed at a lower cost. And that's what we got going on this year. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much for that uh, evidence-based uh, uh, report, uh, particularly regarding the feral pet <coughs> solutions, potential solutions that you are, um, I guess, placing before the Board of Commissioners for consideration. And also, I would like to thank Commissioner Robinson for fostering uh, and spearheading this this presentation. You and him worked in collaboration to bring this information forth to the Board of Commissioners and also the public at large. So very good presentation, a lot going on. I always enjoy myself when I come out to visit uh, the animal shelter, should I say tour, and I appreciate what y'all, you and the staff are doing. Uh, any questions from the Board of Commissioners? Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, I believe you have a comment. Yeah, real quickly, and, and thank you, Madam Chair, and greetings and morning. Um, we did have a conversation regarding, um, we had a capacity um, mm -hmm. um, moment um, at the, at the um, animal shelter. And again, it wasn't enough data points to suggest there was a trend, but we have those moments where we have some pops. And it, I, I thank you for giving me insight. It says that you had uh, mobile um, crates and small, large <coughs> conversion rooms, etc. So it sounds like it was more of an operational solution as opposed to legislative. Is that right? In other words, like to, to deal with those moments where you have those spikes, there's some things operationally that you can you, you have the capacity to do. Is that I'm clarifying? To deal with the spikes, um, we have to have the flexible caging, and yep. if we continue with these trends, we'll have to have more cages. Yeah. Um, also, the other end of that is is uh, personnel. Um, what I did last year was I hired some temporary part-time personnel to help us through the heavy periods, so that's something that I would like to look at to continue doing. This allows us to be flexible and hire more people when there's a need. Um, we're hoping we slow down this winter a little bit. We're still running 47% higher than we did last year, uh, but only time will tell. So um, all these things work together. The, the preventing your intake helps yeah. uh, having a solution for the animals that come in the shelter, or having a pathway for each animal and having the staff to manage those pathways are all things that work together to help in these situations. So operation, I'm going to yield to you and Madam Chair and the County Administrator to figure out, you know, what what your actual need is regarding that flexing up, flexing down, part time volunteers. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to shy away from that. It, my my focus more on the legislative, which is you mentioned ordinance. All right, there was some ordinances that you may need, which obviously gets my attention. <coughs> so, had you worked through the Animal Control Advisory Board Committee? Have y'all come up with a set of recommendations? Like, I mean, what, what, you know, just like our General Assembly says, okay, what do y'all want us to take up? Do you have something specific um, 
that you want us to take up? And, and it, we don't have to, it don't have to be exhaustive right now, but if there, is there a, a, a recommend, you mentioned recommendation, I mean, where is that codified? And, and we can talk about it later, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. how this board takes it up legislatively, I just. Uh, well, um, the <coughs> Animal Advisory Board and I, in the South have been speaking about the ordinances and they will very soon present you with a recommendation for ordinances and then we can review those to see if they suit our needs. Sounds good. That's all I need now, Chair. Okay. okay. All right. Well, any other from the board or commissions? Okay. Thank you so much, Director. Um, Thank you. Thank Appreciate your presentation and your hard work and animal services. All right, now we will go with the approval of the minutes. Uh, board of Commissioners, please take a look at those approval uh, for the minutes and then we will approve accordingly tomorrow. Then also we have a public hear hearing, which is tab number four, a public hearing to amend the Douglas County Code of Ordinance Section 3-27 standard for licenses in regard to RAS training. Um, Manager Ron Roberts. Just give us a brief update. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Chair and Commissioners. So if this, this uh, public hearing will affect the uh, Section 327 of our, our Code of Ordinances. And uh, actually, pull it up right here. You can see what it, what it will do. What we're going to be doing will be removing the uh, RAS training for the servers, not the licensees, not the owners of the restaurants. We're removing it for the servers. Um, they pay $30 a year, and then have to, have to annually do this $30 a year. The licensees are already responsible for those servers as it is. They, we would be replacing it with um, a server permit test, and this would be in line with what the city of Douglasville is currently doing. Now, RAS training is not required by any municipality or county or anything like that. We, as a county, elected to do it, but now we're re revisiting this topic and so that's what that's what it would do. It actually re remove it. Oh, sorry. Last time. There. So, yes, that's the that's the update. And the effect of this, just to put it in perspective, um, uh, I haven't been here quite a year yet, rolling up on it. But I asked staff. I was like, how many people coming through for this rash train? Um, they said that on average they get about thirty to sixty people a year. There's twelve restaurants and bars in the county that, that send servers over for testing. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's uh, so that, that puts in perspective. The county doesn't get a single dollar for the RAS and, uh, certification, but the servers also have to go get a background check annually. They can't have a, a felony or two misdemeanors in the past five years. And then they also have... Um, that costs twenty dollars for background check, twenty five dollars for the we laminate their their ID downstairs, and then it has been the additional thirty dollars. So that's that's what the code change would do. It would remove the RAS training for the servers, not the licensees, going forward. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board? Proposal? And we will discuss this tomorrow in the public hearing in more depth. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. All right, and we'll move on to our business items tab number six. I mean, I'm sorry, tab number five, authorization to approve the memorandum of participation for other post-employment benefits valuation and Kavanaugh McDonald Consultant LLC and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Holman, good morning. Hi, good morning. Um, yes, this is something that is required um, that we do every other year, do an updated actuarial evaluation. Um, and it is, um, as you know, we have one done on our retirement every year. This is, you may hear the acronym OPEB, which is Other Post-Employment Benefits, which is our health care benefits that are offered to retirees. And um, so they get all the data or they request the data from us. We work with MSI and HR, our benefit consultants in our HR department to pull that data together to give to Canavaugh and McDonald. They have a partnership with ACCG. Um, as well as because we have ACC, um, because we have Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance, uh, we are also get a discounted rate for them performing the evaluation because of the access to the data that they, they have. So this is just doing this uh, process again because we did it uh, two years ago. Okay. Questions from the board? Okay, uh, being that uh, Commissioner Carthen will be leading the uh, Benefits Committee, I'm quite sure will be, myself as the Vice Chair with her, will be very in tune with this OPEB 
and this new process. So thank you so much. Um, next we have tab number six, authorization to approve the 2019 West Georgia Regional Library Services contract and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Moore, Lindy Moore, how are you today? <coughs> Um, yes, this is our annual contract with West Georgia Regional Libraries System, um, which Douglas County Public Libraries are under the West Georgia Regional System. This is to provide cataloging and services, um, technical services, as well as our uh, materials budgets. Any comment from the board? Sounds good. Thank you. Appreciate you. I love you. Uh, tab number seven, authorization to accept a check, a check from the Sheriff's Office special projects account in the amount of $899.95 for the purchase of a canine shelter for an outdoor dog kennel. Uh, Major Holmes. Good morning. Um, Good morning. This is a, uh, a purchase. We have, if you go out by the Sheriff's Office, we have our outdoor kennels that we have. But this is actually for like an inclement weather insert that goes in there for the animals. We have one already and we're adding a second one. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the board of comments? Thank you so much. We look forward to seeing that on the agenda tomorrow. Tab number eight, authorization to enter into an agreement with the Georgia Department of Natural Resources of accepting the terms and conditions of the Land and Water Conservation Fund grant approved for Clinton Nature Preserve in the amount of $75,000 I mean, $75, and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Direct, Director Dukes. Good morning. Good morning. This is good news for us. Yeah, this has been a uh, long process. I think it's been about a year mm -hmm. since we uh, started the process, but we have been awarded uh, the $75,000 uh, to build a trailhead out of Clinton Nature Preserve. Uh, my understanding we were, it's getting tougher to get this money. Uh, we were one of 30 something in the state awarded uh, uh, grant funds. So, uh, we ask that uh, you approve it, accept the money. And I know this is good music to uh, Commissioner Guider's ears, uh, being that in Nature Preserve is in District 4. Commissioner, do you have any questions or comments? Yes, I just wanted grant? to ask Gary, uh, now we have trails out there, trailheads and everything. This is an additional trailhead? Well, we have multiple trails, but this will be a trailhead. This will be a place where people will enter the trails. Uh -huh. There'll be a picnic pavilion there. There'll be hardscapes. There'll be a restroom facility there. So. It's basically your focal point to access the trails. Oh, okay. Oh, thank you. And it is an in-kind match, by the way. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Director yes. Hoffman, do you have a comment? Yes. If they can just add Anna in the budget, please. Okay. <coughs> Got it. Anna in the budget. Right. Okay, we'll move on now. <clears throat> Sorry, to tab number nine. Authorization to approve an agreement with the train for quarterly maintenance and repair for the Libert uh, HVAC system in the IS computer room for an annual cost of $1,442.22. And authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Peacock. Yes, Madam Chairman. Uh, as, you as everyone knows, uh, the uh, equipment in a IS or IT room is very susceptible to heat. So we have for downstairs in our IT department, uh, in our IT IS computer room, we have a special HVAC system. And this special this special HVAC system requires spe special care. Uh, and we've uh, isolated and we've interviewed a couple of companies and Train is able to provide us that maintenance and support for that unit. Uh, so we're asking that the uh, commission approve um, us allowing them to do that under contract. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board? <laughs> Commissioner Robinson, question. Yeah, and then this is a, a, maybe a, a broader question, um, um, and, and a Director Martin as well to weigh in. And I think about the IT room and, and to your point, overheating. And it, it, is that the best solution that we have? Can we use that space for something else? Uh, Again, this is a work session, so I'm, I'm just propping this up. It says that, okay, can, can that space be used for um, some other function in the county? And perhaps you outsource that, solving um, overheating with more advanced solution providers like Switch or whomever uh, to avoid hacking and some of the other things. I'm, I'm, I'm just 
I'm curious. This is more for the technology committee to probably consider, right? As a, as a, a I'm, I'm thinking, okay. I, now I've never really spent any time going down there and looking <clears throat> at it, and, and so I, 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 this is more of a, but it, 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 you know, I always wonder when we continue to update contracts, we're just maintaining the old. Have we ever looked at is there a better way to deal with the very thing you're talking about? Like, okay, is this antiquated? Has this floor been here ever since we opened this building? Uh, and I don't know any of those questions, and I'm not challenging it. It's just more of a thought, Madam Chair, okay. um, to, to like, okay, is there a better way? I'm not against the contract as is, because again, that'll take some time to go look at, but it's just something to look at. Shh, you, know, you get it. I'll leave it at that. Okay. Cut the security. I'll leave it. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. God. All right. Well, we'll move on to the next item, which is <clears throat> tab number 10, authorization to renew the contract with the plant, plant handler for monthly maintenance and care for plants throughout the <coughs> house for an annual cost of $1,500 and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Uh, Director Peacock. Again. Yes, ma'am. As, as you walk around the courthouse, you'll see that uh, we do have uh, greenery, live plants that have been placed throughout the courthouse. Uh, they add aesthetically to the look of the courthouse. Um, the contract that we have is with the company called the Plant Peddler. They do an excellent job of keeping the plants um, properly fed and watered and cared for. Um, and um, we're asking that you allow us to continue that contract in 2019. Okay, thank you. Any questions for the board? Okay, I'll move forward to the next item, which is tab number 11, authorization to approve a task order from Moreland Atabelli in the amount of $101,045 to provide Douglas County with an evaluation of pavement on the county's road system and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Peacock. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm sorry, but you did skip 11, but I'll go ahead and talk about 12 since you read it, if that's okay, Madam Chairman. Okay, yes. Um, the, the, uh, the commission had asked uh, the county administrator to uh, actually uh, investigate having an evaluation made of the, pave, of the pavement of the, our county roads. Uh, that has been done, and we um, reached out to the SPLOST program management with Moreland Alta Valley, uh, and they've given us a, a pretty comprehensive uh, a plan with a couple of different approaches, um, or at, I'm sorry, uh, definitely a couple of different proposals uh, for the work to be done. Uh, and we're asking that the board approve us to enter a contract with Moreland Alta Valley to do this uh, performance um, a review of the pavement for a cost of $101,045. And um, the county administrator will answer any questions you have about this. Yes. County Administrator Yeah, there's a recommendation from the uh, Transportation Committee to, to approve this and pay for it out of the Three million dollars is allocated for splash resurfacing for 2019. Uh, it's been probably Miguel could probably answer this, but it's been over 20 years, I'm assuming, something like that, since we evaluated all of our roads. This will evaluate all our roads, uh, categorize them, and prioritize their uh, paving resurfacing needs. Any questions or concerns from the Board of Commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Geiger. Yes, and I've brought this up several times. When we do repave a road, oftentimes we're placed on top of an existing roadbed. We place two or three more inches, and then we have the drop off that causes uh, cars to catch that drop off. Mm -hmm and to tear up the existing paving, whether it's new or not. You can go on West York Mill Road and you can see where the damage is being done because of the drop off. Is this gonna address that? Um, yeah, probably so, but this is more the existing pavement condition. Um, so if there are locations where there are, there are drop offs, then Yes, I'm assuming it would address those. So it's not going to um, be addressing new pavement that we're doing to see that the pavement was done no, properly. That's right? done in that's done when we inspect the roads. Okay, so they're not going to be inspecting the new ones, that's but right. the old ones. Um, um, there's just several places where pavement yeah. 
And the one it's on West Stewart Mail is continuous. On the, on it's a continuous left. problem because of the buses from, from the school. Um, well, it's, it's all over. It's, uh, yeah, it is. Oh, uh, but that one particular is Ephesus because of the buses. Church Road, you know, all these places. But it's because no dirt is put there to level the uh, the lip of the road, the roadbed, or side of the uh, road, you know. Uh, no, after resurfacing, it's either part of the contract or if it's in-house paving, it's it's on us to do that. And that is it is part of the contract for the outside the outside contractors. It is. Yeah, it is. So you're so saying that the contractor who paves the road, they're supposed to just make, make sure that they fill in yeah, it's not the, the shoulder. The shoulder. Yes, That's the word I was looking for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the shoulder, um, but. That it was not. Is this something new? Because it's not something that's been being done. Uh, I, I couldn't speak to how they um, constructed the contract uh, before I arrived, but it is something that you either include with the project or you don't. And in some cases, you can include it as an option. And if the uh, bid comes in higher than you anticipate, then you defer that work to in-house forces. My understanding is that that work was being deferred to in-house forces uh, for at least the previous contract, and uh, so that's why they were doing that uh, in addition to the paving that they were doing. Uh, but the new contract for 2019, the SPLOST and the Elmig resurfacing contract, is going to include the shoulder building component. Very good, because uh, we have some roads that's two, two years old and it's broken on the where it meets the shoulder of the road because of the drop-off and shoulders. The heavier vehicles going. So it doesn't do any good to put a good road down there and then let it be tore up because of the shoulder not being built up. All right, I yield back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Valentine. All right. Um, number 11, we will not be discussing that. Would you have a question? I'm sorry. I, my, I, my head is like Commissioner Robinson. No, we're, we're Commissioner Carpenter. Yeah, I, just to, again, the Transportation Committee did look at this. This is something that was done, but when, again, this is a new year, so I'm just putting out the context that the full board of commissioners did have, you know, um, get an opportunity to sort of take a look at different options for Moreland Altabelli. And this is something that's important. I um, mean, you think about citizens and, and, you know, we're always, what it seems like a lot of times in these work sessions, we talk about what staff needs versus what citizens need. And it, you, you, you gotta balance it, right? Because we're all here for the citizens. <coughs> and, and the citizens are, you know, if you think about when, when they express themselves, it's what they see or feel. Right, so when they plot their subdivisions onto public roads or public access, it's like, okay, how do I fill my road and do I see trash? It's fundamental. And, and, and they begin to feel themselves, meaning how well they believe the county is doing on, beha on their behalf. I mean, yes, there's a lot of stuff we do in the cloak of darkness and the shadows. Got it. But their quickest measure is it, it's, it's really simple. Like, I want to experience my tax dollars on a daily basis. Like, can you... Can you cut the grass on the fair? What you know? Can, can can you pick up the trash? Can can avoid potholes? I mean, they, I mean, they don't really ask for a lot, but yet it seems like to, to get our minds around, like, okay, oh God, we got to cut the grass. Oh, we got to fill in these potholes. But but that's all they're asking. Some things we spend so much time on and so much effort, they're like, okay, okay, whatever. They're turning the channel. And so sometimes I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the things that's really important. So I appreciate, you know, my, my fellow commissioners considering this that um, to rate the roads, so when citizens call, so, okay, but when y'all gonna pay my road? I, I know we've been taxed, I know the money is being appropriated, but where am I on the list? And we know it hasn't been done in years and it's all over the place and we wanna reset the list. So I, I think this is very important. And while I'm, I'm hearing you're capturing all this, I wanna make sure that there's some kind of way back to this very, very, this technology committee is gonna be important. Um, how do we publish where my roads are? Like, where do I fall on the list of things? Because, I mean, we come out every year with this, like, this secret list of 10 rows per county, per, per district. And I, I think that's unfair. If we talk about transparency, I say, you know, spend $100,000 to rate the roads, 
people should be able to put their name in something and just tell them the truth. You're going to be probably two years down the list now based on what it is. Now, we always know that we can change things and we can override based on whatever happens and stuff. But there has to be some kind of way that you just, because, because again, we, we, we smoke and mirror people sometimes with our narrative. We talk about, we think we're going to get around to it. We think we, and I, I don't like that. I don't like that experience. I usually tell myself, well, I didn't say that Lee Roll was going to be done, um, you know, expanded in, <laughs> in 19, that's a real story, in 18, right? And so I have to fight, like, well, who told you that? Right, I'm looking for a track record. I'm looking for receipts that says that we're going to do something. So I, again, I just want to emphasize, I appreciate that this is important. Uh, it is a source of money on, off the top of the transportation dollars as it relates to it, but it's going to be e equally um, distributed, I think, uh, amongst all four districts that this will be done. So I, I just wanted to emphasize this. I'm, I'm happy that this is happening. I yield back. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Carthen. Thank you. Um, I do believe that this is needed because we do need, if it hasn't been done in 20 years, we definitely need to get an update on what our road conditions are. However, my question is regarding purchasing. So was Moreland Altavilla the only ones that responded to your request to do this? Why, my question is why are we going with them? It was not a formal bid process. It was um, a discussion of who was who could provide the service mm -hmm. and Moreland Altabelli came to us or we reached out to them in our discussions just over regular SPLOS projects and they said that they were <coughs> able to do this for us and we said well give us a price. Mm -hmm. So it was not a formal bid, it was more uh, just expanding the existing relationship for what they're already doing with our SPLOS, mm -hmm. just put, putting a little more work on their plate uh, to do for us as they manage the SPLOS program. And did you by chance reach out to see was that price in comparison to what someone else may have been outside of the Mormon Altadilla? Uh, I don't, I did not personally. Okay. Uh, so there really wasn't a way to qual qualify the price and I'll defer to, again to either the DOT director or to the county administrator to add any comments about that if they wish to. So the answer is no. No, okay. no, no unless Miguel so, may know some well, approximate cost yeah. based on experience. I, I don't have um, much to add to what Director uh, Peacock has said about the process. <coughs> uh, however, uh, the work that they are doing for the county, um, other counties have done, including one that I was uh, involved with, and uh, the uh, the proposal that they provided the county is actually fairly competitive for the size of the county. Mm -hmm. So um, if we were to follow the regular bidding process and go out and get multiple uh, proposals, uh, I'm not sure that we would end up with a different result. Of course, I can't tell, uh, but, uh, but it is competitive based on my experience. I think it's always great to, even if we have someone who's already in house and they're already doing it, just to just to see, you know, if what you're giving us is is feasible. I is, agree. Is this, a good uh, this was a unique circumstance, and certainly we do that in 99.9% mm -hmm. .9 of the cases. Are you back? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Commissioner Carlton, um, Commissioner McIver. Um We're not required to bid this out. I guess I assumed it was good. <laughs> it, it's like a professional service. Mm -hmm. uh, so professional services, we're not required to bid them out. We Plus can't. it's like a change order to the existing contract more than that. That, yes. So two different, twofold. But it's an entirely different work. Uh, they're in charge of the squash and everything. This is a different um, scope of, of work. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, uh, when the commissioner brought this out, I just assumed it had been bid out. Um, I, I cannot, I cannot respond. I don't. It was not bid out. It was not bid out. And we're not required to, Kenny, <laughs> to bid out a hundred and something thousand dollars. 
I'm, I'm not sure I understand what the, I, I realize it's, it's in the nature of a professional service mark. I mean, uh, Bill, is it, is it architectural, engineering? What, what is it? I don't understand the baseline. They're evaluating the existing, the existing roads in the county as far as their condition and, and developing a database. And we don't have anybody who it, has done this well, before. I, I don't want to be arguing for or against it. I mean, I think it's a discretionary whether y'all want to bid out. I think what, what staff is trying to say is a matter of convenience. They're already doing DOT work in this community for the SPLOS program, and they went to them and wanted to expand the services. I, I think it's a close call, but I don't know that you have to. You could expand probably off of that. Is What funds are being used to pay for this? SPLOS funds. SPLOS funds. It could be seen as an extension of their SPLOS relationship, but I don't, I'm saying that off the top of my hand without anything in front of me. I don't see it as a significant problem. I think the question is, would the board prefer using its discretion to have it better or not, period? That's the question. Okay, and thank you, Attorney Bernard, for providing that this, this administration has really been very diligent about competitive bidding. That was one of the first things we addressed when I took office. So let's just let's bid it out, and I know Commissioner Robinson is driving this from transportation, so Vice Chairman Robinson, you have a comment. Yeah, I do. Um, Go back to when we when we looked at this 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 initiative. Uh, and this is very transparent, and everybody was at the table. There was no assumptions about what was being done. I'm going to give you context. Um, as many times as I sat there for the past year, talking about street lights, and we talked about uh, bike lanes, and we talked about inspections. And one of the things we asked the question about for the swaths, which is okay, well, why? And Miguel knows we had this conversation. Why didn't, you know, why were inspections being done on roads? Right? And it was stated that we as a board commissioner chose to take that out of the SPLOS or the program manager's function. We would do it in house. And our challenge was well, we had no confidence in our staff being able to deliver because it was never done. Like, well, wait a minute, you said you want to take it out of scope by Moreland. You're going to do it yourself. No problem. Think about it. That, they were in the best place to do this. They're overseeing the whole thing. We're going to take it out, do it ourselves. It never got done. So wait a minute, y'all ain't rate none of these roads? I mean, you didn't you know, inspect any of these roads? <coughs> All right, no problem. Now, you know, we fast forward and stuff. We looked at this thing and said, okay, well, let's, let's rate the roads before we inspect the roads. Mm -hmm. So now we're backing upstream. So we're back to the same place where we took something out of scope out of Moreland. We're using that same place to put something in to get ahead of it. In other words, let's rake the roads first. Let's see where they are. Let's look at the quality. Let's do all that. So when they come and resurface, then we can, you know, obviously inspect after this fact. So I, while I, I get to competitiveness, it's like, well, this is just, to your point, a task order change. This is not something new to the world. Like, we, we were having these conversations. We're trying to separate these like, okay, the unrelated. It's very related, um, in, in my opinion. And so there's no, um, it, it, it to, to, to that point, um, if there was a question about um, why Moreland, we're already there. There are oversight. That was the whole premise. They were in the best position to look out for our best interest. Like, okay, you're, they're not contracting to doing the actual work. It's like, look, you're in the best state. Take a look at this for us. Help us better understand how this is being done. Bring in some proposals. We all looked at the proposals. We all had the conversation. This ain't nothing new. I appreciate it's a new year, but this is not new. We, we spent time. We made sure that the committee looked at it. We made sure that the board of commissioners as a whole got to see this. You got to ask all your questions. You got to look at the Cadillac version. You got to look at the Lexus version, right? Remember all those little analogies they had? So I'm, I'm, I'm reminding everybody about well, were we in, were we, it's about, no, I'll leave it at that. We, we did have the conversation. I'm, I'm not certain that there needs to be a pause. I mean, get the questions answered, but we're trying to keep the system moving. And we're just rating the roads, which hasn't been done. Could we just change it to a change order to the, their contract? Is that not what it is? Isn't that the way it's it's it is? It's order. authorization to approve a task, task order. A task order. Okay. Yeah, it's same thing. Yeah, it's an amendment to the contract. Okay. okay. 
And, and Madam Chair, can I just go a little bit farther? Yes, you may. Um, because this is an evaluation, it sounds like it's a professional service plan as opposed to a construction bid. The state would require if this was a construction project that it be bid. This is not a construction project. This is an evaluation. So I don't have a problem with it from a non-bid standpoint if staff doesn't, but I think it's up to the commission ultimately whether you want it or not. Okay. You, you clarified a few things that bring light mm -hmm. to what I, what we need to do, and we'll just leave it on the, the uh, agenda for tomorrow going forward. Um, let's go, and I will not be discussing tab number 11, because uh, which I know you brought to my attention, Director Peacock. I, the, I did not know that it had been removed from the uh, agenda itself. Yeah, no, I apologize. Reason. I copied the wrong agenda. Okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> the electronic agenda is <laughs> correct. Um, okay. That was removed at the last minute on Friday. But I'm sorry. Okay, and next we'll, we'll move on to our, our tab number 13, authorization to approve an amendment to the uh, SFY uh, 2019 um, aging services contract with the Atlanta Region Commission and authorize the chairman to sign all the related documents. Director uh, Hagan. Good morning. Good morning. Well, this is an amendment to the state, as you said, to the state fiscal year 2019 contract with ARC for the provision of aging services in the county. Um, happy to note that it provides an additional $109,954 uh, that will be a big help in providing services. Um, specifically, uh, the funding will allow us to serve an additional 23 to 25 home delivery meal clients. Um, provide additional homemaker services and also greatly increase the number of non-emergency medical transportation trips so that that will be a big help so we're very excited about this thank you so much any questions from the board sounds like good news commissioner Carthy. uh you, you know I'm, I'm, I'm all over this because i do meals on wheels and have for almost 10 years now mm -hmm. so it's exciting to know that those services will continue and it's expanded. So. Right, and I'd just like to publicly say we thank you for, for what you've done for 10 years. And if I'm not mistaken, you delivered last week or the week before, <laughs> even after <laughs> taking office here. So we appreciate all you've done. And we appreciate all you do. It, it, it is a great service. And the seniors really appreciate just having that person come in. And just right. Again, so well, because thank you for all you've done. All right, and thank you, Commissioner Crawford. And also, I look forward to continuing uh, serving from the Atlanta Region Commission uh, position for seniors and aging in aging independence for Douglas County citizens. And I promise I will continue to push and advocate for our seniors here to make sure we uh, continue to garner and secure dollars to accommodate the needs here for our citizens. And we appreciate that very much, too. Right, thank you. We we'll move on to tab number 14, authorization to accept anonymous donations of $4,500 to the fire department and amend the budget. Chief Spencer. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. And Happy morning. New Year to everybody. Good morning, Chief. Uh, yes, ma'am. This is a uh, check that for the last several years, uh, there's a company in Douglas County that uh, wishes to remain anonymous. Uh, that gives the fire department $4,500 uh, for us to use how we see fit. Uh, several years, for the past several years, we've used it for training purposes. That's what we anticipate doing again this year with it. <coughs> Madam, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. Mr. Vice Chair, Scott, yeah. Scott, one thing before we roll with this, technically speaking, as I've said before, there's no anonymity in government when you okay. give money, but to the extent that someone wanted to discover where the check come from under Open Records Act, it could, but I'm not going to make you say the company, but what we do need to know is, number one, they're not a current vendor and they're not bidding on any projects as far as this payment. Do you understand that or yes, sir. can you say that with certainty? I, I and, and, so. and they understand we can't guarantee their anonymity if somebody wants to right. know they are. And, and they, they can. can. The, the, when they send us the check, they, they also send a letter saying if we can remain anonymous. Okay. Well, I'm not going to broadcast, so I just want to make sure they're not under any kind of bid no. where they're trying to influence anything other than just making a gratuitous no. donation. Uh, to, to that point, the floor has been yielded. So to that point, just to clarify, um, Council Bernard, can you just bring this back up? And Chief Spencer, can you be prepared just to make that statement, that acknowledgement on, on 
on our when we vote tomorrow? Sure. Chief, you okay? Yes, sir. All right, and again, one more time, this is, we have done this before. This is not a new, that what you're stating, correct? Yes, sir. And accepting of dollars for this. We've accepted dollars with the caveat, we can't make it anonymous, we just don't over-broadcast it, but technically it's a public record. I appreciate that. Any questions from my colleagues? No? Chief, thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. Yes, the next item, authorization to renew an agreement with Dr. Raymond L. Fowler, MD, to serve as the medical director for the Douglas County Fire EMS Department and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Right. Yes, sir. Again. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Fowler. He is a uh, uh, county resident, uh, uh, Fowler Fields, Fowler Homes. Uh, he's part of the Fowler family. Uh, he's been our medical director for 30 plus years. Uh, does an excellent job for us. He's helped us with write our own protocols. Uh, he's a tremendous asset to this community. Uh, and, and he does not charge us near what he probably should or could charge us uh, to provide these services for us. So uh, I would urge the commission to let's renew his contract. <coughs> And um, how long has he been? Say that again. How long has he been? He has been our medical director <coughs> since 1981. Okay. He's I, a boy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, he's, but he's part. He's a fabric. He's he's, he's a fab, you know part of the fabric of the county. Uh, are you comfortable uh, in that we're getting the services that we need? Is that what I'm hearing? I am 110 percent comfortable with, with what Dr. Fowler does for us. Uh, and we can call him at any time. Uh, he's also an associate professor out at the uh, University of uh, Texas. Thank you. Very good. Uh, and, any comments from my colleagues? No? Okay. Thanks, Chief. Thank now, you. Four is the yield back, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you so much, Chief. Uh, tab number 16, authorization to establish a one-way passenger fares, or should I say one-way passenger fares for uh, Connect Douglas fixed route service. Mr. Watson, good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, Hello. Board of Commissioners. Before I start on this agenda item, if you allow me, I would like to introduce to you Jamal Shepard, who is our new Transit Services Coordinator. His main responsibility will be to oversee our bus service once it comes online. Uh, Jamal has been with us since last Wednesday, and he has hit the ground running. Uh, I've given him a, a list of about nine priority items that we need completed in the next six weeks to two months, and he's been busy at work on those uh, since he's been with us. And I'm going to yield the floor to him for just a minute to let him give you a little of his background. Jamal. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Jamal Shepard. Um, I come from you guys from Georgia Department of Transportation. Uh, I worked there for five years, doing also the same thing, uh, regional transportation specialist, but up in, but up in the Northeast Corridor. Um, and also prior to then, I came from MARTA for about 15 years, uh, once again working in bus and uh, rail operations, uh, doing computer support and also uh, dispatching. So I look forward to uh, being a part of the New Douglas County family and helping Mr. Gary and Mr. Miguel, I didn't see you earlier. Uh, bring the uh, fixed route bus services on board. And I think our target goal is for April, around, April. around April. So I'm working diligently um, <laughs> trying, to, trying to get a couple of plans together, our paratransit plan as well as, well as our procedure and our operation for, for the transit as well. So again, I uh, thank you guys for uh, welcoming and allowing me to come up and speak in front of you this morning. Right, the chair on the board. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Board of Commissioners, do you have any questions for yeah. I would just like to say welcome, and we appreciate you bringing your expertise. Yes, ma'am. Talented mm -hmm. Douglas County. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> On to the agenda item now about the fare for the fixed route service. This has been a topic of conversation several times within the Transportation uh, Committee. Uh, we've looked at fares of transit agencies in the Atlanta area, and we've also looked at fares of transit agencies throughout the southeast that we felt like would be comparable to, to, to what we're doing. Uh, there's a wide range of fares, ranging from a dollar <coughs> on up to about $3 uh, per person. Uh, 
each member of our committee has sort of had their own idea on what the fare should be. But, but after a lot of the discussion and after looking at the fares charged by other transit agencies and the, the money that we could expect our uh, various fares to generate, uh, this is a recommendation that we come up with for the full board of commissioners. And that is to set our, our standard base one-way fare at $2.50 and the fare for seniors, disabled, and students at $1. And that's a recommendation that we bring forward for you this morning. Okay, thank you, uh, Director Watson. Any questions or comments on the board of commissioners? Board of commissioners? Any comments? Okay. Uh, Vice Chairman Robinson? Yeah, I mean, I, I want this to, to fall short um, on um, when you talk about pricing, we, we always talk about um, operational costs and, and, and spend, but there's also sort of a, a, a user fee and a contribution and what is the fair share. And so the, I, I, this is one of the last acts of, um, that we had in our, our transportation community before it's, it, it begins anew this year. But we really talked about this. We were very, very thoughtful. And this wasn't done um, with an Excel spreadsheet, with me being in the corner, me and Gary going around and around on what this should be. Um, um, Director Watson, did we not also get feedback from citizens on what would be a good number? Yes, sir. <clears throat> As we held our uh, community meetings in December, this was one of the questions that we asked them. Uh, and the way we phrased it was, uh, do you think $2.50 would be a reasonable fare? Uh, we got very little uh, pushback on that. Everybody seemed comfortable with that but again that that is our our base fare we did want to give seniors disabled and students a break and that's why how we came up with one dollar fare for them okay. um, on this my last point on the seniors now i know that um, as, as a base level of two dollars and fifty cent which makes us compatible with the broader bigger system um, in the metro atlanta area both with cobb and um, as well as marta um, explain what the federal discount would have been was it fifty percent of the rate? Was it the the federal regulation is that for seniors and disabled you, you have to uh, provide them with a fifty percent fare during non-peak times, which basically would be say from nine o'clock in the morning to four o'clock in the afternoon. And in our discussions in the transportation committee. We, we wanted to uh, stay away from <coughs> peak and non-peak, uh, believing that that would cause some confusion, especially with our, our elder, elderly um, clients. So our, our, what we chose to recommend was that, that we discount the fare at $1 for all hours of service. And I appreciate that. So think about a 50% discount on $2.50 would be, what, a dollar and a quarter? Right. When we had this conversation with the seniors and stuff, they, they sort of saw it before. They're like, oh, we, we ain't trying to break change. They said, they'll get more dollars out of us. They said, we'll get on the system real easy. We just want to get on. You know, but you got to listen to the richness of the exchange. I mean, we, if you really listen to citizens, it's like, got it. They said, so, I mean, they don't want to break change. They ain't got time. I mean, that, that, I'm like, I got it. So the dollar was easy. You'll get more rise out of me with just a single dollar than trying to do the dollar twenty-five. So some things are not rocket science. Uh, but again, I just wanted to bring that up. That that's why we did that. We we're actually going beyond what the federal regulations require us, but it's the right thing to do. How do you feel, Okay. Thank you, Vice Chairman. Any other comments? Okay. Um, we'll move on to the next item, tab number 17, authorization to approve an agreement with the collaborative firm for 2019 marketing, promotional, and outreach services for Connect Douglas and authorize the chairman to sign all related documents. Director Watson, yes, can you tell us what this is about? This, this is another item that's been heavily discussed by the Transportation Committee. Uh, the collaborative firm has been with us for about six months now, working on two separate uh, three month contracts uh, and they've been very helpful to us um, with our public outreach, uh, getting the word out about not only our bus service but also the, the other services that we currently operate. So they've done a really good job with that. Um, they've also um, done a, a lot of work in 
in helping us to, to try to put some policies uh, in place um, as we go out to the public. Um, as we reach this point now, uh, we've looked back at the work that they've done. We've been very satisfied with the work that they've done. But uh, we also realize that there's so much more to do as we move forward, uh, especially with the, the time remaining that we have before we actually launch the service. Uh, we still have so many things that we need to do as far as letting the community know about what we're going to be doing. And then once we actually start the service, we're, we're going to enter into an evaluation period of, of what we're doing right, what needs to be corrected, and what we need to let the public know uh, about the service as it actually comes online. So the collaborative firm has put together a full 2019 scope of work for us. It, it's very comprehensive. Um, and it's things that we absolutely need to have done. And so the recommendation coming from the, the Transportation Committee is to enter into a 2019 contract with the collaborative firm for the amount of $150,000 uh, with this money to come from the Capital Transportation Fund. And that's the recommendation that we bring to you this morning. Any questions or comments from the Board Commissioners? Okay, thank you, uh, Director Watson. Next, before I ask the attorney if we need to go into executive session, I would like to make an announcement of our commissioning uh, committee assignments for 2019. Uh, just I will reiterate this with our board of commissioners and also make this information public to our citizens uh, here in Douglas County. Um, if you just follow me, Board of Commissioners, um, our Benefits Committee will be led by our <coughs> Commissioner Carthen, who will be the chairman of this committee, and I will be the vice chairman with her on the committee, uh, Benefits Committee. Finance Committee, Ms. Commissioner Robinson is the chairman, and I'm the vice chairman of the committee. Programming Committee, we have Commissioner Mitchell as the chairman, and Commissioner Carthen is the vice chairman of this committee. Safety Committee, we have Commissioner Carlton. Uh, it's only one member that usually from the Board of Commissioners uh, represent on the Safety Committee. Um, and Commissioner Carlton will lead this, lead this committee. Technology Committee, we have Commissioner Mitchell, who is the chairman of the committee, and then Commissioner Guida is the vice chairman. On our Pension Advisory Board, uh, I am the chairman of the Pension Advisory Board, and then we have Commissioner Carlton, who is the vice chairman. And then our Transportation Committee is Commissioner Robinson, and I am the Vice Chairman of the Transportation Committee. And then Fire and EMS, we have Commissioner Guider as the Chairman of the Fire and EMS, and also Commissioner Carthen is the Vice Chairman. And Intergovernmental Committee is uh, myself, uh, from, uh, Commissioner Jones. And then we'll move to Parks and Recreation and Oversight Committee. We have C Commissioner Henry Mitchell, the third, who is still the uh, chairman, and then we have Commissioner Carthen, who will join him as the vice chairman. And our Public Safety Committee, we have Commissioner uh, Guider will lead this committee. Um, this is a pretty big one, and it's the public safety one. And um, Chairman Jones is the vice chair, uh, is the vice chairman, which is myself. And our Stakeholders Committee is being led by um, me, myself, and then our Commissioner Guider is the vice chairman. And our purchasing oversight, we have three committees that are a new, relatively new uh, purchasing oversight committee that will be led by Commissioner Carthen. And uh, our Commissioner Robinson is the vice chairman, so Commissioner Carthen is the chairman of this committee. And the residential and housing development committee will be led by Commissioner uh, Vice Chairman Robinson, and then I will be uh, the vice chairman of this committee. And then last but not least is tax abatement compliance and that will be led by Commissioner Guider. She will be the chairman of this committee, and then our vice chairman of this committee it will be Commissioner Carpen. So this is our 2019, uh, 2019 committee assignments, and I, um, I'm very optimistic and uh, encouraged that our commissioners will do a very good job in leading these specific committees and uh, as we continue to move Douglas County forwards. So with that being said, Attorney Bernard, do we need to go into executive session? We do, Madam Chair, for litigation. Okay. 
Board of Commissioners, do we have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. We have a, we have a motion in a second. All in favor say aye. Uh -huh. All opposed the same. And the motion carries. Lunch is served. Uh, we'll come back in 10 minutes. A 10 minute break and then we'll come back in 10 minutes. All right. So get your lunch and get your lunch. Okay, Board of Commissioners, any other questions or comments regarding uh, anything related to this agenda today? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay. That being said, this meeting is adjourned.